Hi there. This is the fourth episode in the series on necklocks. And uh, we've looked at the mechanics of the necklock and we've looked at the application and we've looked at um, the uh, specifics of the uh, lateral vascular necklock or rear naked. So in this one, we're going to be talking about defense against the necklock. And the reason that this is important is that is due to the rise in um, both mixed martial arts and uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, because <clears throat> the skill of being able to apply a necklock has been much more widely spread throughout the community and uh, inevitably the uh, percentage of bad guys who acquire the training uh, has increased. Now in the past, in traditional martial arts, there was sort of an ethical base to self-defense and um, it, it, it was kind of baked into the whole training. There was etiquette and respect and the way training was conducted generally speaking that there, there were exceptions and you could have bullying and things like that but in the mainstream generally it, it was um, done on a pretty um, as I say ethical basis not so much with the mixed martial arts and um, one of the factors I would say um, a friend of mine who is a very, very well-known um, mixed martial arts instructor, particularly a grappling instructor, and I was working with him, and he was um, bemoaning the fact that he didn't have any clients for private lessons because they were all in jail. Um, there's an awful lot of bad guys have been attracted to um, various forms of mixed martial arts, and um, just have a look at the number of even professional fighters who've ended up in prison for one thing or another. For crime, I don't mean for defending themselves, for actual criminal behaviour. Um, it's, it's a little bit disproportionate. Now, I, I'm not slagging off mixed martial arts. It's a wonderful sport. It's a wonderful uh, activity. Um, I, I'm a big supporter of it. I watched the very first UFC and I've watched them since. Um, but it's an unfortunate fact that that, that occurs. And Cy Squires tells a, a story of a chap he knew. He was a rugby player, a really big unit, and somebody you really wouldn't want to mess with. And he <clears throat> he was in a pub, he'd gone to the toilets, and he as he came out of the toilets, uh, a group of three or four guys, young guys, were approaching him. As he walked past, he heard one say, did you see him? And then that's all he remembers. He felt pressure on his neck and then he was unconscious. Um, one of them had just leapt on him, applied a rear naked, rendered him unconscious. Uh, so it, it's definitely a factor. And... There is historical precedent for this. The um, thugs, the thuggies in India, were renowned for uh, their expertise with their neck locks, particularly using the garrote. They had um, a length of silk or the rumal, which they were very adroit with. And um, because at that time, India was part of the British Empire. There was an interchange and the techniques came back, mainly with people who'd served out there and spread to the criminal classes here. Uh, his, historical records show that garroting was carried out by a team of three, the front stall, the back stall and the nasty man. The two stalls were primarily watchers and the nasty man did the deed. The intention was neither to kill nor maim but to rob. The nasty man came up behind the victim and tapped or smacked him on the forehead, 
causing the victim to lift his chin so the garrote could be applied. In, in the history of um, judo, it, it uh, outlined outbreaks of garroting occurred in Liverpool in the <clears throat> 1880s and 1890s and 72 people were flogged for the offence. This led to the Security from Violence Act passed in 1863 and spe specifically targeted street robbery becoming known informally as the Garotters Act. So it's not necessarily a new thing but it's certainly something that should be part of your self-protection training. You should know uh, how the neck lock is applied and the best way to defend against it. And we'll go on to discuss this in detail. Now, to be realistic, it's unlikely if somebody really knows the technique, has trained it extensively in um, in the gym and maybe even in competition uh, for a period of time and he decides to target your neck uh, by surprise, it's very, very unlikely that you'll be able to successfully escape. However, it has been done. A um, couple of examples come to mind. <clears throat> Nightclub in Liverpool city centre several years ago and a guy w was becoming aggressive and two doormen bracketed him. And Now these guys were highly experienced themselves. Um, both highly high level grapplers, wrestlers um, and also one in particular was a champion in local uh, cage fighting. So they really knew and pretty tough characters. So when the guy started to get out of hand, uh, one of them grabbed him from behind in the rear naked. And as I say, this is an experienced grappler, knows how to do it, puts it on, and the guy just bursts out of it. Whereas the other doorman who's facing him then pulls him into a guillotine, locks a guillotine on, he bursts out of that. So they um, subdued him into unconsciousness with their two-way radios. Another example was one of the original gutter fighters who was working on a door in Southport. And um, again, a guy needed to be um, escorted out. He puts a neck lock on him and the guy reaches up, grabs his arm and broke both bones, radius and ulna. Just yanked down and broke both his arm bones. And this is a strong guy trained on the weights and everything. So um, there have been cases where it's, you can successfully escape. But I would say from having seen many hundreds of neck locks applied over the years, apart from those examples I've just outlined, which I didn't actually myself witness, but I heard about them. Um, I could say successful uh, resistance or escapes from the neck lock, um, fingers of one hand. Um, one in particular, which I wouldn't class as an escape, but it was interesting. This was the first time I've ever known the um, neck lock to fail. Um, I put it on a guy and there was no effect. And he, he wasn't a particularly big guy, just normal sized guy. Put it on him, it, in my opinion, it was on properly. And after several seconds, no effect. My colleague laughed at this and said, I'll take over, took him off me. He put it on and again, nothing happened. The guy didn't go out. His neck started creaking and he lost controls of his, uh, of his bladder but he didn't actually go unconscious. So there are, um, there are always exceptions that prove the rule. And the rule is really, when somebody knows what they're doing, then it's a highly, highly effective technique. We'll go on to discuss 
the specific techniques we need to help to escape. Okay, so these are a couple of generic techniques that uh, should be in your armory when faced with any rear attack, but in particular the neck lock. So this isn't specific of how to uh, defeat the rear naked, but this is uh, the striking tools that um, you, you would be able to use. And the first uh, we'll look at is the uh, rear elbow strike. Okay. So the other tool, and this can be used in combination, is uh, one I've taught for a long time, and it's the um, groin slap. And it can be a slap and grab to the testicles as well. It's basically the heel targets the pubic bone, and the fingers come around, hit the testicles, and then you can grab, twist, and pull. Uh, a point about um, the elbow and the uh, groin slap, we index on our own body for both of these techniques. Use the body index because the guy's going to be behind you. You don't have to find him. He's right in line with your body. So that's a little point. That'll come up a bit, bit later as well. Now let's have a look at the fundamentals of the escape, the main points. Okay, so we'll just go over that in detail. So as Mark starts to choke, as soon as Sai's aware of it in his vision, he chins down, he grabs the arm, pulls it away, and he bends forward, gets his hips aggressively forward as much as possible. So that's the initial reaction. Okay, so if you take that on board, that... Um, Assuming a, a, a very much uh, a weight forward posture, grabbing his arm and um, preventing lo your own loss of balance. That's the basic structure of it. From there, you can then start applying the strikes or whatever. But another very important thing is uh, what we call the phobic response. So for this... Uh, NLP has long taught, and it was a main part of NLP, is the phobia cure. Now, a phobia is a single exposure learning experience. So there's a trigger, usually fairly early in your life. Something startles you or frightens you. And from then on, you have that same reaction. Classic one is spiders. Okay, you know, by surprise, you see a spider and it triggers this phobic response and then for the rest of your life, whenever you see a spider, you have the same response. Even if you see a picture of a spider or a spider in a movie, you'll have that response. And I had an aunt who, who was arachnophobic. And it was amazing because she she had a, like a sixth sense about spiders. She'd be sitting watching the telly and she'd just turn around. No, there's one behind and she was gone. And the interesting thing uh, from the NLP point of view is that it, it's a hardwired response and you never forget to do it. You, you never get lazy about, oh, I don't think I'll do it now and so on. It's there. So if you look at it from the opposite point of view, how can we make a positive of that? If we can install that phobic response as a trigger to an action which can help um, save our, our lives rather than mess them up. So if you have the whole thing about anything coming around your neck being the trigger, the phobic response, and um, build it up in class, so as soon as that's on, you go into the technique that you've just been seeing, that, that grab, balance break, uh, solidify. 
straight away. Now, if it turns out that it's, it's a friend or, you, you know, the, your uh, family member is just messing about, you haven't damaged them at that stage. You've just defended yourself. And if you find that the person is trying to really put the pressure on, then you can go to town with the strikes or other options. So uh, a good drill for this, because it, it, to help install it at the subconscious level, is, is to have a drill where you're striking a pad or the bag or whatever, and then just a random uh, training partner comes up and grabs you, sometimes from the left, sometimes from the right. But as soon as you get that around the, the neck, you go into the phobic response. And then you can build it up and add the strikes and so on. Uh, and then after a short period of time, it becomes um, a motor program that you can use. And uh, we taught the concept on an international or on a seminar a few years ago. And it was well received. So <clears throat> that's uh, a thing to consider. Another technique you can use, possibly from your initial response, is this one. You've got options from here, the strikes, etc. But a, a, a good option is this, which is Tartosh Judo Throw. Uh, a training drill that we used uh, a few years ago uh, it combines inoculation of the feeling of the neck lock with the ability to strike. And uh, so, um, in the old phrase we used to use, paired up in threes, uh, you have one partner is uh, fighting to put a, a neck lock on you and the other's presenting a mitt at various angles and you've got to strike it. And you do it for uh, bursts of 10 seconds. Have a look. Now, one of the important things is to realize that a neck lock is a very serious attack. It's uh, potentially grievous bodily harm, even lethal force. So where it's legal, in countries where they allow it, uh, the use of of a self-protection knife uh, to counter the neck lock uh, is an option. Now, it's not my job to convince people to carry any particular weapon, but if it's um, something you already do or you've considered or is legal, then um, this is one situation where um, it's probably uh, a really good option because in those situations where if if your response has failed and the guy's got it on you've literally got seconds before everything goes starts going black and probably the only way out would be to stab him um, as we say cut loose so uh, the probably the best tool is a compact fixed blade and there's many options for this um, very very good designs out there um, th that do the job if you do go for uh, a folder what you want really and folders add a level of complexity but to try to to minimize the complexity what we want is some a folder that has the wave device. That's this little um, 
projection there which catches on the pocket or the waistband as you draw and the knife opens automatically uh, similarly we have um, on the southern comfort knife same idea to, it's actually designed as a bottle opener believe it or not I, I did a review of this knife it's a fantastic design and um, again but that catches in the pocket it's very positive and uh, it's a decent blade for self-protection as well for both um, stabbing and slashing so there's a couple of options and uh, in using the knife to um, stab backwards then like with the elbow strike or the palm strike your index on your body is going to be there behind you you don't have to sort of wildly flail behind and uh, repeated um, str strikes to really get his attention is, is what you want uh, if, if you're going to cut his encircling arm it's best to cut outwards you don't want to be stabbing in towards yourself if you suddenly let go or the knife slips you know it's the most vulnerable area so cut away from yourself um, as Lofty used to say always cut towards your mate so finally just to sum up the neck lock is potentially a very damaging attack now in my previous videos uh, I emphasize when when we teach it to security people um, and the police in the United States particularly used it a lot it was done in the most uh, safe manner for all concerned so there were ways of as soon as the guy starts to slump you you go down with him we show this in one of the videos turn with him put him in the recovery position you you, you know you you do have a duty of care to that extent last thing you want is is to just release somebody and you go down smash their unconscious unprotected head on the floor um there's been people killed you know the the uh, the boxing um punch to the jaw has killed people not from the punch but from the fall um, now the guy who uh, is attacking you he's probably not going to have that juicy of care in mind and he's, he'll he could just let you go smash your head um, various forms of injury what's in his mind why is he attacking you uh, once you're unconscious he can dance all over you he can cause severe injury broken bones damaged limbs uh, severe brain damage from loss of, of uh, blood um, with a female it can be rape uh, all sorts of things so that's why I've emphasized in this video the importance of that phobic response that that being able to fight straight away and keep the fight going whatever you do whatever it takes to win because at the end of the day we we can't protect others if we can't protect ourselves so I hope these thoughts have um, at least uh, given you some insights into how to train how to protect you're not going to learn this from watching a video get on the gym floor get a training partner and do it for real.